Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Drive-In Worship at Friendship Baptist Church. We are so grateful that we are able to gather to worship the one true God, even in these unusual times. And we are so glad that you have decided to come out and join us today. Service will begin shortly, but before then, we wanted to take this time to let you know some of the ways that you can connect with us during this season. Every Sunday, until the gathering ban has been lifted, we will be offering one drive-in worship service at 10.30 a.m., as long as the weather is permitting. This is such a fun and unique way to gather. If you haven't already, download or take a screenshot of today's lyrics and sermon outline from Facebook. Sometimes our cellular service can be a little spotty in our parking lot, so we wanted to encourage you to do this ahead of time in the future. In the case of inclement weather in the future, an announcement will be made by 5 o'clock on Saturday night on social media and at friendshiprva.org whether or not we will be having drive-in service. If drive-in worship is canceled, we will be moving to a live stream worship service at 1030 that you can stream on our website, on Facebook, and on YouTube. Sometime today, we encourage you to please go on our website and fill out your connection card. We would love to know what God is doing. Good morning, everybody. Anybody want to give me a little honk if you can hear me in the radio? Okay, we're good. All right, like I think two of you can hear me. That's great. All right. No. Um, so welcome. Happy Mother's Day to everybody. We're going to do a little Mother's Day giveaway here in a minute, but we're so glad you're here um, to worship, and I hope, uh, though, that you're not forgetting your mothers today and that... Uh, you're reaching out, and as you have the opportunity, that you can um, can uh, just bless them and honor them for their role. And I'm going to be talking about one of the Ten Commandments later in the message, the one about honoring the Sabbath. Um, and so it reminds me, though, that the Fifth Commandment in Exodus 20:12 is that we honor our father and mother. And I think you know, having Mother's Day and Father's Day is is one of the ways that we do that. Um, that we, the Bible commands us. We are to honor our fathers. We are to honor our mothers. So we want to do that this morning. So um, in the spirit of that, um, let me see. Jay Walland, is there, does the men's ministry, do you all have flowers to give away? He says yes, all right? So um, somehow, some way, if you're a mom, the men's ministry is going to get you a flower to go as you go out of here this morning. Um, so, but this morning, we're going to give away, I got three um uh, winners this morning. Um, so let's go with this one. And this this one is often um, a very easy one, uh, but you never know. So we'll ask. So uh, we're going to give away a little uh, little gift for Mother's Day to the mother of the most children. So uh, if you have four or more children, honk the, the horn of your car. All right, we got two with two two with four or more. All right, how about five or more? All right, who's got five or more? Wave your hand. Five or more children. Jim Gruber, you have five children? Y'all have, y'all, y'all have, y'all, has somebody in your family birthed six children? Okay, well, this is one mom, six children. Is that, anybody, so is, that, is that correct, Jim? You have a six? No, okay, all right. How many, how many have birthed five children in here? All right, I think... I, and that's the one giveaway, I think, and that's going to be Kristen Coots with her five lovely children. And so Hannah is going to run a quick gift out to her. Mike, if you make Mike Saunders, can you meet her and pass that on to Kristen? All right, now um, the, we're going to go next with the youngest mother among us, or, or I should say not the youngest, but the most recent mother, the one who's had the most recent child. So the youngest child a uh, parent with the youngest child here. So does anybody have a child? Blow your horn if you have a child under the age of two. I got a couple. All right. Anybody under the age of 18 months? All right. Who's that? Wave your hand if you got an 18 month. Oh, there they are. It's the Creeds over there. They did show up. All right. Hey, Creeds. I hadn't seen you all yet. Welcome, guys. So they've got little baby B, Blair, and uh, they are the winners of the... Uh, newest child and now something maybe unique what i wanted to do something different this morning i didn't want to do the oldest mom because you know you moms don't like talking about your age or whatever right so we're going to do something different i want to find out who is the mom with the oldest child present 
So it's, if you have a child here, we're going to find out who is a mom who has the oldest child that is here with them today celebrating Mother's Day. So if you have a child that's here today, you don't have to be in the same car, but that they're here. If you see, let's go with, um, if you have a child here today who's over the age of 25, give me a quick beep on your horn. Anybody here with a child over the age of 25? All right, I heard one, and now I've got a hand because I know that, okay, there's two. All right, who is that? Who, who is right there? I can't see. Brenda, uh, Brenda it's, and Margaret. Okay, it's Brenda and Margaret. All right, Margaret, all right. So who's got a child over the age of 35 that's here today? Is that, is that Margaret again? All right. Um, so that's it. Margaret, you're the winner. So, all right. So, uh, Margaret Lucas, congratulations. We celebrate all of our moms today. Moms, thank you. Uh, I learned something this weekend. A lot of y'all have seen my Facebook post. My wonderful daughter, Hannah, wanted to bless her mom with three meals on Mother's Day. Uh, that wasn't going to happen today because of church, so we did it yesterday. Uh, and I can relate to some things now about you moms that, uh, that have spent a lot of time in the kitchen. Um, you know, we, a lot of us times we men, um, and this is stereotypes and generalizations, but we kind of take for granted, you know, that uh, if we have a lady in our life who does a lot of cooking and enjoys cooking, the, the amount of work that's involved there. Um, and so I spent all that time in the kitchen yesterday with Hannah, and I, I had this point, I didn't have to say it, but I know it's been told me before as, as a younger person when, the, when the, my mom or some lady that was in the kitchen basically would say, look, the kitchen is closed. But they, they had had it. They're done. They've done all the work. And you don't come in here asking now. You missed it. The kitchen is closed. And so I appreciate all of you who work so hard um, feeding us and taking care of us. I appreciate my mom. My mom should be out there um, on Facebook somewhere listening. So happy Mother's Day, Mom. I appreciate you and all that you've done for me. And we celebrate you um, this morning. But we are here to celebrate um, the gift of Jesus uh, and who he is, his death, his life is death his burial, his resurrection, and the salvation that we know in him. So um, as we continue to worship this morning, we welcome you. Um, and Jacob and Hannah are going to lead us in some music this morning as we worship um, our Savior. We're going to sing to him, we're going to sing for him, and we're going to sing about him. So let's join together now in worship. Standing on the promises of Christ my King. Through eternal ages let his praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God my Savior Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God Standing on the promises that cannot fall When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail By the living word of God I shall prevail Standing on the promises of God Standing, standing Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior as my all in all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Sing that one more time. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. 
Amen. And if you guys want to go ahead and pull out your Bibles, uh, whether you've got your physical copy with you or um, your, uh, uh, on your phone uh, through maybe the Version app, but I would encourage you to bring your Bibles with you every week and bring a pencil and a marker or something to just take some notes and just write down whatever the Lord would put on your hearts. But we're going to be in Mark chapter 3 this morning as we're studying through the Gospel of Mark. And I'm going to read several uh, verses uh, out of them, and I'll give you a heads up as I'm going to jump around a little bit as we go. So starting in Mark chapter 3, verse 1, it says, And he entered the synagogue again, and a man was there who had a withered hand. So they watched him closely, whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Step forward. Then he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. Then jumping to verse 13, it says, and, and he, that is Jesus, went up on the mountain and called to him those he himself wanted, and they came to him. Then he appointed twelve that they might be with him, and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. And then verses 28 and 29, Assuredly, I say to you, All sins will be forgiven the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. We're going to be looking in uh, this morning a little bit deeper as Mark presents to us the gospel, the good news, the life and teachings about Jesus as he takes us on a deeper dive each, each week, each chapter, each verse into what this gospel is, what this news is for our lives. Let us pray together. Lord God, we just thank you for um, this beautiful day, this uh, beautiful day to remember um, our moms and uh, just the gift of life and family uh, and the blessings that we have, and we're just so grateful. And so, Lord, we just look to you and we express our gratitude for you, for these things. God, we love you. God, thank you for um, just giving us the opportunity to gather freely to worship. God, thank you that our country affords us the opportunity to gather and to, and to honor you and, God, and, to, and to study and to preach and to teach and to believe and to act on your word uh, without fear. God, thank you that we can come out here on a beautiful day like this and gather and celebrate you. God, to be together as uh, part of the family of God, as part of the church, the body and the bride of Christ, uh, and just to enjoy uh, the company and the fellowship of being together Uh, and and being one uh, together with you. God, we are one. We are one body. We are one unit, God, and we all work together, God, for uh, the furtherance of your kingdom. Lord God, we just continue to pray for our world as we just continue in this pandemic, and we pray that you would deliver us, God, from sickness and disease. God, continue to keep your hand um, over our doctors and nurses and all the first responders and just everybody that's serving and going out of their way to continue to provide for us and to keep us safe. We pray for, um, uh, uh, we pray for the ability just to overcome this disease. We pray that you would um, deliver us from it. Um, God, and we just pray for comfort, God, for those who are impacted by it. God, many have been impacted by the disease itself. God, they've, they've gotten sick. Many have lost loved ones. God, and, and beyond that, people have lost jobs and, uh, and income. And God, the impact that that has on families and the, and the fear and, and all that comes on people. And God, I just pray that, um, Lord, that we would rise above that in faith. God, believing and trusting that you are our provider. And that, God, no matter what happens, God, you are with us and that you love us and that you keep us. God, thank you for just being with us through all of this. We love you so much. And God, we just continue also just to lift up um, our country and, and God, just all the turmoil um, and the, the uncivility, if that's even a word, God, but we're just not civil. We're just not kind. God, you've, you've called us to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you've called us to love our neighbor as ourselves. God, may we be proactive in loving. God, we want to see a revival. We want to see change come back to this country. Um, Lord, we want to see a return to you. 
So God, do whatever it takes and work and begin it in me, Father, and begin it in this church. God, may we be a part of what you want to do to return uh, this country back to you and back to faith. God, that we would love you and that we would love one another. God, just continue to work. God, um, keep your hand over our church. Uh, Lord, we're, uh, we're just so grateful to, 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 to have the opportunities we have. But Lord, as we continue to navigate, God, just help us to just truly see how you want us to grow and love you in all of this. God, we love you and give you this time in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing together this morning. One day when heaven was filled with his praises, one day when sin was as black as could be, Jesus came forth to be born of a virgin, dwelt among men, my example is he. Word became flesh and light shines among us, his glory revealed. Living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day one day they led him Calvary's mountain One day they nailed him To die on a tree Suffering anguish Despised and rejected Bearing our sins My Redeemer is he Hands the heal nations Stretched out on a tree Took the nails from me Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified freely forever. One day, he's coming. Oh, glorious day! Oh, glorious day. day the grave could consume him no longer one day the stone rolled away from the door and then he arose oh death he had conquered now he's ascended my lord evermore death could not hold him the grave could not keep him Rising again, living he loved me, dying he saved me, buried he carried my sins far away, rising he justified freely forever, one day he's coming, oh glorious day, oh glorious day. sound for his coming one day the skies with his glories will shine wonderful day my beloved one bringing my savior jesus is mine living he loved me dying he saved me buried he cared Sins far away, rising, he justified freely forever. One day he's coming, oh glorious 
day, oh glorious day, glorious day, oh glorious day. Let's all declare this next song together. Our Father everlasting, the all-creating One, God Almighty. Through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Savior. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Our judge and our defender suffered and crucified. Forgiveness is in you. Descended into darkness, you rose in glorious life. Forever seated high. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus. Today, let's sing that out one more time. And I believe in you, and I believe you rose again, and I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I believe in life eternal I believe in the virgin birth I believe in the saints communion and in your holy church I believe in the resurrection when Jesus comes again for I believe in the name of Jesus I believe in God our Father I believe in Christ the Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one, I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again, for I believe in the name of Jesus, for I believe in the name of Jesus, for I believe how comforting it is to believe in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that we can um, lift up lyrics like that to you. And Lord, that without a shadow of a doubt that we can believe that they're true. And God, today, um, as we gather once again um, in an unusual way, and um, Lord, we look at this world around us and the, just the things that are going on that it just seems so, just so backwards and so... Um, 
just so different than what we're used to. God, I just pray that um, each and every one of us here today who believe in the name of Jesus become beacons of light to spread that message, to spread the message that we believe in Jesus Christ and that we can have peace because of that. God, we love you and we thank you for your son, Jesus. And today we're excited to dig into your word. And it's in your name that I pray. Amen. All right. Um, I'm so grateful for uh, Jacob and Hannah and their uh, leadership while in this season when we're out here. And right now we're limited, you know, in theory to 10 people outside. And uh, I guess I hear that the end of this coming week, um, they're going to be loosening some restrictions and things like that. And so some things might change, but know that we're going to be talking about, you know, what that will look like for us as a church and how we transition and uh, based on what, what we really can do and what's going to be best for us. So uh, be prepared for that. Um, also wanted to mention that, uh, and this impacts what we do next Sunday, we were planning to have our uh, volunteer meeting for our uh, sports camp. Um, that last year we, we did a sports camp for the community and we're going to do that again this year. And next week at 4 p.m. we were planning to have a virtual meeting um, and we want everybody that has any interest in volunteering with uh, sports camp to be on that meeting. Uh, and, and with the restrictions might being changed and lifted, we might be able to have that meeting live, which would be even better. But we will let you know, but be prepared for that. And if, if you have any interest and certainly be praying for our sports camp, um, we want you to be out um, there or be in that meeting, whether it's uh, online or whether it will be in person here next Sunday at four. And, and I love it when I get things wrong because it always gives me a chance to be humbled and to apologize. And Jay Wallen, I owe you an apology this morning. You know, you're picking on him when he drove in right at the end of the, uh, right as the surface was about to start because he was responsible for getting the flowers for all of you ladies for Mother's Day as a, as a gift from our men's ministry. And he did, and he brought them and told me that he left them in the kitchen in the, in the refrigerator, and they've been sitting there all morning, and that's why they didn't get passed out before the service. So, Jay, you did your part, didn't you? I can see you, yeah. I appreciate Jay and all of you um, in every way that you serve. Um, and so we will make sure, ladies, that we honor you at the flower on the way out this morning. So, again, thank you, Jay, and men's ministry. And uh, we'll, we'll hand those out as you guys exit this morning. But go ahead and turn in your Bibles again to Mark chapter 3. Um, um, I love the, uh, that we're doing this series in, in the gospel according to Mark. And um, I, you might remember a couple of fall festivals ago, um, I, I, uh, I dressed up as Where's Waldo, and I hope you're familiar with that little kid's game where um, there's this character Waldo, and he has these bright blue pants on, and he has a, a red and white striped shirt, and a, and a red and white striped hat, and these black rim glasses, and, and, and he's, he's just so gaudy and obvious, and if he were alone on a piece of paper, if you draw him on a page, and he's just there on a blank piece of white paper, you can see him clearly, simply, plainly, but the point of the whole Where's Waldo thing is, is that they fill these pages with similar colors and similar designs and all these things to distract you from, from finding and seeing Waldo, obviously. And I think that's what happens a lot, though, with, with what um, true faith and what true following of Jesus and what true Christianity is all about. Is it supposed to be something as plain and simple as Waldo just on a page by himself that you could see it and, and hey, there he is. And you could see the, what the faith is all about. You go, that's, that's it. But what happens is, is we get involved in all this religion and, and we start cluttering it with all these things. And in the midst of that, a lot of times people can't see the pure and, and simple um, good news about what Christianity is all about. That it's not religion and it is a relationship. And that's what we're going to be talking about this morning. And again, the Gospel of, of Mark, you might even look on, if you, if you got the outline, um, Mark chapter 1 though, verse 1, if you flip back there, the very first verse he says, this is the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Mark was a young man who was a friend of uh, the disciple Peter. He, he knew Paul, and they think that Mark really wrote for Peter, that he's telling Peter's story. And so he's writing what he calls the gospel, which can mean the life and teachings of Jesus. We have four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's like Jesus' biography of those three years of his life. Um, when he was ministering before his, his crucifixion, uh, death, and uh, burial, and resurrection. Uh, so you have these life and teachings of Jesus, and so Mark is sharing that with us. We, we learn that it's more than just the life and teachings about Jesus. That's the physical side of the gospel. But the gospel it, it, in its simplicity is, is joyous news. The gospel at its basis, it's news. It's something that, that, it's news that everybody needs to hear. And it's not just normal everyday news like, hey, today's Mother's Day. I mean, that's a great day. It's a great thing to celebrate. But the gospel is news that if we understand it and its, what its basic truth and its simplicity, 
and that if we get it, we would, we, would, we would drop everything and reorient our lives and begin following after that message. That's what the Bible calls repentance, is that you hear this news of the gospel, and you go, you know what? I was wrong. I was going in the wrong direction, and I need to change direction. I need to reorient my life around this message because it's news. And what happens is we clutter it like that Where's Waldo picture with a lot of advice, and that's what religion is. Religion is advice that we would give you and say, hey, well, you know, you could do this better or you should, you haven't been doing this and you should do that. And we start lumping in all these laws and rules and regulations. We cover it and we clutter it all up so you can't see it for what it is. And that's religion and that's advice. But the gospel at, at its, its basis is news and it's the best news of all time. And so as we continue in this gospel of Mark's study, um, God, Mark is just going to continue to, to further bring clarity through the, the, the teachings and the actions of the life of Jesus to show us what this good news of Jesus is all about, what this gospel of Jesus is all about. So my outline this morning, number one, is that this good news about Jesus shows us that knowing God is more than rule following. Showing, uh, knowing, uh, the good news about Jesus is that knowing God is, is so much more than just following a bunch of rules. We start in chapter 3 here again in verses 1 through 6. It says that Jesus entered the synagogue again, and, and he's there, and a man was there with a withered hand. And so he's there, and, and everybody's watching, and they're wondering, what's, God, what's Jesus? He's there on the Sabbath day, and, and this man has got a withered hand, and they're wondering if he's going to heal his hand. And so verse 3, he says, he said to the man, step forward. He steps forward, and he says, is it lawful to do on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil or to save life or to kill it? And they kept silent. And when he looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out, and it was restored as whole as the others. And then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. So what's going on here is that we, we know that God had way back when, when he had delivered the Israelites out of Egypt and led them into uh, the wilderness, and he met with them there at Mount Sinai, and he gave Moses the, the commandments and, and with the primary ten that there's this commandment about the Sabbath. It was the fourth commandment, and back in Exodus chapter 20, he says, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. So God has given us his command. He says, I want you to take a Sabbath days of rest. Just like I work for six days, stop my work, and I just, I just was on the seventh day. And he says, I, and I love it, and uh, even uh, further on in Exodus, um, he says that the Sabbath is a gift to us. But what had happened is, is that the, the, in Jesus' day, the religious leaders had cluttered the Sabbath with all of these rules and regulations and all this advice about how to keep it. And they were totally, you know, kind of missing the force for the trees. They were missing the point. And so they're watching Jesus as this man comes together or comes to him with his withered hand. And he's saying, you know what, and I know they're watching me. Is it wrong or right for me to bring and restore this man's hand back to full health? Because isn't that what Sabbath is about? The Sabbath, taking rest and honoring God and stopping our labor, it, it's a day for us to restore ourselves. It's, a, it's restore our rest, to restore our worship and to focus on God. And, and, and the, the religious leaders and, and, and Judaism of the day had messed it all up and it became about, hey, here's all these different rules. And if you do all these different things, you're going to be violating the Sabbath. And so they're watching and Jesus, it's so, it's so interesting that it says he looked around at them with anger. We don't think about Jesus getting mad, but he gets mad about when, when people take what should be simple and what should be God-honoring, and we clutter it with a bunch of other things that shouldn't be there. And it says his heart was grieved because their hearts had been hardened to the simplicity of the gospel, of what God wanted to do in their lives. Here's a man, you know, isn't that what the Sabbath should be used for? Shouldn't it be used to restore this man's hand to do good and not evil, to bring life and not death? You know, what better, what, what, what better thing could they do on that Sabbath day than to see this man healed? But they couldn't see it for the hardness of their heart. So Jesus gets angry, but he does heal the man. And that's what the Sabbath is all about. I remember I grew up in Raleigh, uh, and there was, a, there was a big church in Raleigh, and, and everybody could see it because you rode down this main kind of drag in Raleigh. It's kind of like the whole street of Raleigh. You would see this church. They had a huge parking lot, and they had basketball goals out there. 
and they had taken and they, they had created uh, and they had hand, they had spray painted on there. They had gotten the little frame and put it on and and they spray painted it and they pulled it off and you can see the lettering and it said no Sunday sports. And everybody could see that when you would drive down this road. Is that this church would, would had this rule that they had, they had added said you cannot play sports here on Saturday. And it, you know and it, and it made me think you know like is that really what the Sabbath is all about? I mean, are we teaching and showing that maybe we should we should get a little, um, you know, something with spray paint on all of our, our uh, board games at home? No Sunday build, uh, board games. You know, it's just another rule that they've added to it, and I think they're missing the point when they're trying to just say to everybody, you know, I think they were well intended. They wanted people to honor God on the Sabbath, but it's a matter of the heart, not a matter of rule following. And is it really wrong or right to play sports or board games or something else on the Sabbath? You know, we, we've got to ask ourselves that question, but are we missing the force for the trees? And if somebody doesn't want to play sports on Sunday, then that's fine. Th then do that and honor the Lord with that. But let's not be like the Pharisees and, and, and add these rules to people that, that it wasn't meant to be. God, G God said in, in Exodus that the, the Sabbath was a gift. That the, Jesus said that the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. God gave it to us so that we could not just create a bunch of rules about keeping it, but seeing how we could honor God and rest and restore and, and use it to worship and, and to bless others. The word Sabbath really means deep rest. It's a time for us to just to take a break from what we normally do, but do the things that restore us. We just recently got through a course called Emotionally Healthy Spirituality earlier this year. And a big part of that course is, is, is talking about Sabbath and what that means for us today. And it's, it's something that I'm still learning. And I'll be honest, like in this season of us self-quarantining and limiting, you know, social distancing and all, my life has been busy in different ways, but it's been less busy in other ways. And I've honestly been resting so much better and, and, and different. And man, it's making me realize like, you know what, there's some things that are, I just need to get out of my life that I'm, I'm cluttering, you know, my life with so many things and I'm missing out on what God has for me. And, and that's the application here, you know, is, is um, are you resting? Are, are you practicing Sabbath in some way? Are, are you setting aside time during your week from your work and your busyness to recover and restore and to celebrate and to renew? That's what Jesus wants for us. And so when he sees this man with a withered hand and, and the Pharisees are worried about rule following, Jesus is like, this isn't about following rules. This is about restoration. And, the, and the, I've given you the Sabbath, and I'm going to do good on the Sabbath. And I'm going to restore this man's hand. So what we see here this morning is that the gospel is not about rule following. Uh, it's not about advice. It, it, it is about something else. And that's number two, is that the good news about Jesus is that he calls us to life-giving, life-empowering relationship. The gospel is about a restored relationship with God. Look, look at what he says. We read this earlier when he called his disciples to him, starting in verse 13. It says, he went up, that's Jesus, onto the mountain, and he called to him those he wanted, and they came to him, and he appointed 12, and notice what it says first, that they might be with him. It goes on to say that they, they would send him out to preach, and they'd cast out demons, and they would do other things. But he starts off by saying that he called his disciples because he wanted a relationship with them. He wanted them to be close to him. He wanted them to be with him. And I don't want us to miss that, that the, the point of the gospel is that God sent Christ, his son, to die on the cross for our sins and to rise again victorious over death so that he could restore us back to himself so that we could have a relationship with him. He wants us to be with him. It's not about you know following the rules and, and just showing up and going through the motions. It's about having a restored relationship with God. John 15, 5 says this, Jesus said, I am the vine, you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit, for apart for without me you can do nothing. Jesus compares himself, he says, I'm the vine, you're the branch. A branch can only have life and health and fruit when it's connected to its source, the vine. And that's what God wants from us. He wants us to be with him. He wants us to learn to find our life in him. And, and I think about it in terms of like sports or music. If, if a player can't show up for practice, he's not going to be ready for game day. He's got to be with the team. He's got to be with the coach. He's got to learn how to, you know, to, to be ready for that. You know, if you're in an orchestra, you know, if you can't show up for practices, you're not going to be able to really play when it comes time to perform. And it's this point of like, we've got to learn how to, to truly find our life and strength to be that branch connected to the vine and getting that life from him. 
when I was a youth pastor, I used to, I used to talk about that, um, use the example that I stole from another youth pastor. He would, he would say this, he would say, I could make the best macaroni and cheese in the world. And he compared it to his students would come to a, you know, to the meeting on Sunday night and Wednesday night, and he would serve them macaroni and cheese. And that would be their food for the week. And every Sunday they got fed and every Wednesday they got fed. They got, man, you make the best macaroni and cheese in the world. We love it. We come here and we get that and we get filled up. But then the next day and the next day, Monday and Tuesday, they weren't eating. They get fed on Wednesday and then Thursday, Friday, Saturday. They, they weren't learning how to feed themselves. And his point was, is that, yeah, we, you know, you can come to church and you can get fed and you can get nourished spiritually. But God does, that's not the end of, of it all. It, it's a part of it. God wants us to learn how to feed ourselves. He wants to learn us how to learn how to make macaroni and cheese, get in the kitchen. So you don't want to go malnourished, you know, those other days of the week. And spiritually, we've got to do the same thing. We have to learn how to, to feed ourselves, to make our own spiritual macaroni and cheese by learning how to get along with God and abiding with him daily. I think about, again, the Israelites and, and, um, and the Exodus, and they, they needed bread. And God said, you know what, I'm going to provide bread from heaven for you. And I'm going to, do, here, I'm going to send you manna every day. And every day I want you to go out and I want you to collect enough manna for you and your family just for this day. Don't get enough for the next day or the next day, just one day. Because he was trying to teach them a principle. I want you to learn to trust me every day of your life. That you come to me, not on Sunday, not on Wednesday, but every day. And that you, you depend on me throughout each day. And so you can, and the principle there is you can't depend on yesterday's manna. Because the manna, if they collected too much manna, thinking, oh, well, I'm not going to go out tomorrow and collect any, it, it would rot and stink and, and grow worms. It wouldn't remain until the next day. God was saying, you can't depend on yesterday's manna. You've got to come to me every day and enjoy that abiding relationship. And I'm going to nourish you and provide for you. And it's interesting. He said on the sixth day, he said, I, want, I do want you on the sixth day. I want you to collect enough manna for two days because the seventh day is the Sabbath day. And I want you to have enough so that you don't have to work on that day that I'm going to nourish you then too. And so the, 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 the manna wouldn't rot. It wouldn't stink. It wouldn't grow worms. And then they were able to nourish themselves on what God had provided that day as well god wants us to he calls us to be with him and that's what jesus did with his disciples he said it's not about rule following i want you to know that i love you and i want you to be with me and so much so that i'm going to send my son to be that news that great news that you can be restored back to me are you are you abiding in the vine each and every day uh, and if you if you're not god doesn't want you to feel guilty about that he wants you to come to him tomorrow and say, God, I'm going to start learning how to, to make this macaroni and cheese on my own. I'm going, to, I'm going to come and get some manna from you today. I'm going to abide in you today. God, help me. Finally today, the good news about Jesus that Mark takes us deeper into this morning is the idea that forgiveness abounds. When, with the gospel, forgiveness and God's grace abounds. Mark chapter 3, verses 28 and 29. This is one of the hardest passages in the Bible for many to understand. Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men and whatever blasphemies they utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation. A lot of times people read this passage and they get so caught up in verse 29 and they're like, man, all oh, the blasphemy of, of the Holy Spirit, it's unforgivable, right? It's, I can't be forgiven. I'm not going to get any pardon. And we get, what is that? And I need to understand that. And I'm so worried about that. And, and we're missing the forest again for the trees. Waldo's right there to be seen in verse 28. I want you to hear this. Jesus says, assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men in whatever blasphemies they utter. There's the good news is that God is a forgiving God. He says all sins can be forgiven. God does not want you to miss that message, getting caught up with trying to figure out what does he mean about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Yeah, we'll talk about that in a minute, what that might mean. But God wants you to hear this message today that he loves you and that he is offering forgiveness and that Jesus became sin for us on the cross so that we could believe in him and receive him into our lives and have a restored relationship with God that we might be with him and not just follow a bunch of rules but have vital life that comes from him. All sins can be forgiven. That is the message. In, um, in Psalm chapter 103, uh, it says, For as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy towards those who fear him as far as the east is from the west, so far as he removed our transgressions from us. He wants to take our sin and throw it as far as the east is from the west. That's an eternity. He wants to, he, that's what Christ has done for us. Isaiah 1.18, it says, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. 
Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. They are, though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. The gospel says that Jesus came to wipe away all of our sins. And some of us, we, we think, you know what? I, I've sinned too much, and I've gone too far. And I'm here to tell you that Jesus says here in John, or Mark chapter 3, verse 28, all sins will be forgiven the sons of men. God, Jesus has, has borne your cross, or borne your sins on the cross. You cannot go so far away from him that you can't be forgiven. That, that any time that we're ready to re- repent and reorient our life, that we hear the news about Jesus and go, okay, now I get it. The, the, I've gotten all those other distractions out of the Where's Waldo, and I can see it now. He loves you. And that's why Christ came, that he makes sense of everything. And yes, we'll still have our questions. We won't be able to understand. And we, we can work on those things. Like every Wednesday night, we're trying to cover a topic that's one of these hard questions of, of the culture and Christianity and trying to make sense of those tough things. We, we'll do that together. But you need to hear the message that God loves you and that you haven't gone too far, and that he wants to forgive you and bring you back into relationship with him. Isn't that not amazing news? If you've never ever believed in that news if you came in here this morning and and you have not put your trust and faith in Jesus I want you to know that he's ready to receive you there's a verse in in the gospel of John where he said where Jesus was he's quoted as saying when I am lifted up I will draw all men unto myself I know I'm guilty of cluttering that verse sometimes Jesus said when I'm lifted up and he's talking about being lifted up on the cross that he's going to draw all men and that's women too to himself and sometimes I'll clutter that verse in my prayers and I'll say, draw all men and women to yourself. And God's just convict me, you know, I don't need to pray that because that's a promise. God has already said when I'm lifted up and he's already been lifted up that he will draw all to himself. He is drawing each and every one of us to himself. He is knocking on the door of your heart and he has been and he will continue to do that. And he invites you to just say yes to him. To humble yourself, it requires humility. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. You are never going to know the, the grace of God until you humble yourself. And it's a humbling thing to say, okay, God, I messed it up. I've been going in the wrong direction, and I've heard the news, and I need to reorient my life. And that's going to freak a lot of people out because they're going to be, man, what happened? You're, you're, you're doing something different now, and they're going to know it. But, man, it is the best news in the world, and it is life-changing, life-reorienting. Shout, shout it out loud, you know, shout it at the mountaintops kind of news. He has been lifted up and he is drawing you today. And that's when we're coming back to this idea about the, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? You know, all sins will be forgiven men and all blasphemies except for, you know, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. That can't be pardoned. Most people would tell you this is, that this is probably what Jesus is trying to say here. Is that the Holy Spirit is the means by which God draws you to himself. Jesus has been lifted up to draw you. The Holy Spirit is going to come knocking on the door in your heart. and He's going to say, I love you. I care about you. I want to come in and have a relationship with you so that you can be with me. I want to bring forgiveness into your life. And he just keeps knocking. And throughout our lifetime, he's going to knock you. and He's going to be drawing you. He's going to say, today is the day. Would you please let me in? I love you. But if we continue to resist the work of the Spirit in our life, and we get to the end of our days and we haven't received Jesus, that, that means we blasphemed the Holy Spirit because, it, because we've, re, we've rejected the one way of pardon. The one way of pardon is the work of God's Spirit in your life through what Jesus did on the cross. And, that's, and so it's not necessarily that it's, un, the, un, it's, even it's kind of a misnomer to call it the unforgivable sin because what it really means is that you've just, you've just rejected the one way of pardon. You have resisted the Holy Spirit, and I pray that you won't do that today. If you're not yet a follower of Jesus, I know that God's knocking on the door of your heart because God has promised that. But if you are a follower of Jesus, here's what happens a lot of times is that, is that um, we, we, uh, even though we've received the gospel, we've believed it, and we, we've started following Jesus, we've reoriented our lives, a lot of times what happens is we start walking in the wrong direction again. And we start carrying a weight of guilt on ourselves because we're sinning and we're wandering away from God. And, 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 and that's out of his love that he, he allows that weight to be there. But he doesn't want us to carry that weight. Christ has already carried that weight. And that's why I've shared with you this gospel prayer that my friend J.D. wrote. He said, in Jesus, there is nothing we can do to make him love us more. And there is nothing that we can do to make him love us less. When we're in Christ, there is nothing I can do. All of my obedience doesn't make him love me more. He loves me eternally the same, no matter what my behavior, good or bad. 
And there's no sin I commit that, that God would say, you know what, I just don't love Pastor Mike anymore. He's beyond pardon. He's beyond, beyond forgiveness. No, when I'm in Jesus, I am forever in his hand. And he loves me simply because of what Jesus has done, not because I'm, I'm super obedient or not because I've been disobedient. He loves you. And if you're carrying over a heavy weight of guilt this morning, don't leave here with that. That is not what the gospel tells you. That's clutter. That's the enemy accusing you of something. God never accuses. God offers forgiveness. So I hope if you're a believer today that you will learn to walk in that good news of the gospel today. Don't leave here allowing the enemy to get the best of you. So that's the gospel this morning. Mark takes us deeper into this gospel message, and it's not about rule following like the Pharisees wanted it to be. It's not about advice. It's about the good news about Jesus. And part of that news is he, he rescued us and redeems us for a relationship with him. That's why he called his disciples. And, uh, and, and it's all about forgiveness, and that he offers a forgiveness for every sin. And that's there for us if we will receive it. Let's, let's bow and pray together. God, thank you so much for every uh, man, woman, and child that is, is hearing this this morning. I'm so grateful for them. God, you love them as much as you love me, and I'm so grateful for your love for me, God. God, you have changed my life, uh, and, and it's not that I'm special, God, because I'm not. But God, you're special, and this news is the best news that we could ever, ever, ever hear. And God, I pray if there's somebody here this morning who has never accepted that news about Jesus and what he wants to do in their lives, that they will believe today and receive you into their life. It's as simple as that, God. It's not hard. It's not cluttered with a lot of rules and regulations and do's and don'ts. It's simply what Christ has done for them. God, may they believe today. And God, may they respond saying yes. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If um, God is doing something in your life today, and I know he is because he's doing it in mine and he just promises to continue to do that, I hope that you will respond in some way. We have that online connection card. Uh, you guys hopefully have my phone number. You can text me. You can email me. Um, and, and what we want to do every week as we depart, we have the offering basket that's there. I want to encourage you, leave me a response. Grab a, a napkin, an extra piece of paper, a receipt from, you know, McDonald's or wherever it is you go to get Coke products. There you go, John. And right on there, you know what, Pastor Mike, I need a conversation. God's doing something in my life, and I, want to, I, need, I need some wisdom. I need some advice. I need, I need to talk to you about what God is doing. And you drop that piece of paper in that basket, and that will get to me, and I'll follow up, and we'll see what God is doing, and we'll walk, begin, you know, continue this journey together towards him. But if it's not in the, in the basket, then make it online. You know, send me a text. Send me an email. Don't miss this opportunity to respond to him. Jacob and Hannah are going to link, lead us in the last song, and then I'll come up and dismiss us. Oh, Lord, my God, when I in awesome wonder consider I see the stars and I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout the universe display Then sings my soul Out of acclamation 
and take me home. Oh, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and their proclaim. thing before we go um, last year in April we voted as a church uh, on the, some spiritual directions and part of that was a creation of a spiritual directions team uh, that's been meeting and one of the things that they wanted to do was uh, um, just up um, our prayer uh, in our church for our community for our world and just for God's direction and hand upon us and one of the ways they wanted to do that uh, was a couple months ago was um, starting to have prayer times after our services to offer um, to meet with people and just pray together uh, for our spiritual directions, to pray for our world, to pray for our community. But with the things going on with the coronavirus and social distancing and whatever, we haven't been able to do that. And so this morning, I'm going to say that prayer um, uh, for the spiritual directions team. And maybe just maybe with the, the, the restrictions being lifted at the end of this week or on Friday, um, we might be able to start having those prayer times together here. Even if we continue with drive through services, we'll be able to have more people out and about um, and doing that. Uh, but I want to pray for a couple things this morning on behalf of our spiritual directions team. One is just for our world and the, the coronavirus and COVID-19 crisis. Uh, I want to pray uh, for um, our um, community outreach. That's one of the thing, one of the initiatives, one of the spiritual directions was, you know, increase community outreach. And we're talking about a couple of different ideas that we're, we're setting in place for the fall that we want to pray for regarding our ministry to our community, um, our ministry to the community via uh, Jacob's Road and some other opportunities. And just say, God, you know, God has called us to be sent ones. You know, he sends us out. He was sent here for us and he sends us out with the good news, that great message, not advice, but the message of the gospel and how we can, our lives can be restored. And so I want to pray for those things this morning together. So let's bow and pray. Lord God, um, thank you for um, what Christ has done for us. God, we are forever grateful, and Lord, we cannot keep this news to ourselves. And God, we want to share that news, and that news has impact in every area of life. And God, we just continue to lift up our world, um, our country and our world in this coronavirus uh, pandemic. God, we do pray again for healing. We pray for deliverance from it. But in all things, God, may we be the hands and feet of Christ. May we really uh, love you, but love our neighbor as ourself. God, may we uh, just be transformed and changed to just care for people in new ways because of this. And may you be glorified and Christ exalted in all of this so that more and more will come to know Christ in all of this. And God, we just pray for our community. We pray for our school. We pray for its leadership, its teachers, its students, the families that are represented there. We pray for everybody that, that God is here uh, right around this little corner where, God, you have perfectly positioned us. God, we pray that that we would be sent ones and that this gospel message, this news would go out from us, God. And God, you have, you have positioned each one of us where we are in our families, in our work, in our schools, and everything. God, you have put us there to be salt and light for you. So God, help us to do that. God, strengthen each man, woman, and child that's here this morning. God, thank you for them. Um, God, 
just continue your work, God, and may we see um, the fruit, and may you be glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. As we depart, um, as I think the typical standard, we kind of go from this direction to that, to that direction. Uh, the parking attendants will be there to help you get out and get out safely, and we do encourage you to limit getting out and social distancing and all of that as we go. The basket will be there, the net, um, to throw in your offering or your prayer requests as you go out. You can get a flower this morning from our men's ministry. Moms, we love you. You're the best. We couldn't do it without you. We're so grateful for you. Thanks for all you put into our lives. Friendship Baptist, we love you, and you are sent.